रेमिडीज The webinar has been scheduled to be held uh, for roughly two hours, from 2:30 p.m. in Indian Standard Time to uh, 4:30 p.m. or 5 p.m. at most in Indian Standard Time uh, during 27th and 28th of August 2020. Amidst this COVID pandemic, when our movements are restricted due to safety reasons. when educational institutes are only functional and working through the online portal kaliyagunj college has also decided to organize few webinars and also online classes as part of its academic curriculum this webinar is the third webinar of the college and the first international webinar organized by the department of economics on behalf of the department of economics that is a professor uh shundi sundas and also arindam de these three uh, consist the department of economics uh, and also organizing committee of the webinar i welcome you all in this webinar i welcome a uh, very honorable professor shantri roy mukherjee who is dean faculty council of pg studies in arts commerce and law and also professor department of economics of north bengal universities he is my friend philosopher and guy as all you know uh, despite her busiest schedule she agreed to deliver her keynote address to this webinar i also welcome one of my university professor i don't know whether he is still here professor ajita borai choudhury of jatapur university who has consented to deliver his valuable lecture on covid 19 and economic rejuvenation in technical session we also have dr bibhash shah who is associate professor in economics from durham university in the united kingdom it's our great privilege to have dr shah amongst us who will talk on health challenges in india these three speakers will deliver their lectures today tomorrow we will have another session where in harai of jagat university Professor Parthu Pratim Pal from Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, and Professor Orijita Dotto of Calcutta University will deliver their precious lectures. I also welcome them. Uh, I think only Parthu is present over here. I also welcome all these distinguished speakers in this webinar. There are few statutory warnings which I which I must mention before starting of this webinar. we request all the audience to kindly mute your microphone and video options during the uh, process of this webinar uh, only speaker should unmute himself or herself and make him or her visible it will help us to carry on the session smoothly i will request all the audience not to press the presentation button at the time of the webinar audience can put their questions with their name designation and affiliation within chat box and this is also equally true for the youtube viewers uh we will we will just request uh, we will just collect those questions in the interactive sessions and we'll ask our speakers to uh, resolve your queries uh, speakers will obviously respond to your queries i guess Uh, in the uh, interactive session so with all your good wishes let me allow to proceed further we will now invite our very honorable principal sir vijush kumar dash to deliver his inaugural speech sir professor vijush kumar dash he will deliver his inaugural speech
Am I audible to you? Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. You are audible. You are audible. Okay. okay. Lastly, I told you that camera may be off sometimes, but audio will continue. Anyway. Good afternoon to all of you. Economics department of our college, in collaboration with IQAC, is organizing a webinar on post-COVID situations in Indian and West Bengal economy, challenges and remedies. Actually, we feel happy to organize seminars on different topics by the different departments regularly. That activity has been suspended due to COVID-19 situation since March 20. We are continuing that activity through these webinars. And Chandan told that this is our third webinar and first international webinar. Anyway, we have got six eminent scholars, professors, and speakers in this webinar. Firstly, Professor Sanchari Rai Mukherjee, Dean, Faculty, PG, Faculty Council of PG Studies for Arts, Commerce and Law, University of North Bengal. Second, Professor Ajita Horai Chodhuri, Department of Economics, Yadapur University. Third, Professor Bibha Shah, Durham University, Department of Economics, UK. Fourth, Professor Shaikat Shinharai, Department of Economics, Jadapur University. Fifth, Professor Parthopotim Pal, IIM, Joka, Kolkata. And sixth, Professor Origi Dottu, Department of Economics, Calcutta University. All are very reputed educationists and economists. I welcome all of them. Actually, I am not a student of economics. Anyway, in spite of that, let me allow to share a few lines on the topic. We know the world is facing humanity's biggest crisis since World War II. Almost every country has been affected by the devastating coronavirus disease that is COVID-19. The world is passing through a great uncertainty. Undoubtedly, the coronavirus has put the world economy at a major risk. Although India has managed to well till death the spread of the virus, but COVID-19 pandemic has already disrupted normal economic activity and life in our country. India's trade has been severely impacted. People have a sudden loss of their income, resulting in a major drop in demand. To rescue the economy, India has announced impressive fiscal and monetary stimulus packages. But this pandemic has a strong foreign and trade policy effects also. There are primarily two major challenges that the Indian economy is now facing or is facing at present. Firstly, is to save the country from the spread of coronavirus, which is a health emergency. Saving lives is the principal concern of the Indian government. Secondly, is to save the economy from the unfolding economic crisis due to the dual effects of coronavirus pandemic and the global and nationwide lockdown. Actually, overall, COVID-19 has brought untold misery 
to a large section of low income individuals across the globe or across the world. I think some major issues that we need to tackle now to make sure our economy takes a fast after the lockdown is lifted are these are fast. Preventing another COVID-19 outbreak. Sometimes we learn that another wave will come in October or November. If this be fact, then this will be critical for any country or businesses. A new wave of COVID-19 will be hard to recover from. We should start, just now we should have to start the detailed COVID-19 guidelines and make it mandatory compliance for companies in the post lockdown period. Businesses should put in extra effort to make sure that the factories are COVID-19 compliant. This step will also build confidence in the workforce and will ensure better production. Secondly, lack of manpower. We have to face it now. This looming issue in the post down lockdown will disturb us. That is the lack of workforce and manpower. Most of the workers are migrant and may not be able to return to work soon. Companies will have to start operating at very low capacity due to shortage of manpower. This will require businesses to take up substantial measures for work safety and in providing benefits like housing near the place of work to the workers, etc. Businesses will have also required to think out of the box and establish process to employ available workforce efficiently. As per example, we know that all available workforce cannot work together due to COVID-19 guidelines. So, multiple shifts may be introduced by providing other benefits to the workers, utilizing available capacities of business, etc. Thirdly, unanticipated demand in the post lockdown period, the demand will be too much uncertain. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the supply chain across the globe. Post lockdown, it will be very difficult for business to predict from where and what level of demand will come. Businesses should have to scenario planning teams and what will be the function of these planning teams? These teams will help to cover multiple demand scenarios and to plan solutions accordingly, managing other stakeholders like vendors to ensure supplies. Next, the fourth is movement of the people. We all know that unlocking has been started in stages or in phases and the movement of the people have to be very restricted in the beginning as it could enable a second wave of COVID-19 which you have to register at any cost. Lastly, the supply chain. Once lockdown is lifted, one of the most crucial things to make sure that we are on a path of exponential growth and we have to ensure that our physical supply chain operates seamlessly without any obstruction. As a country, we should have to define clear guidelines on the movement of the goods, states, businesses and industry bodies would need to work together in making this to happen. Anyway, we know that in webinar, the time is short, so we all have to follow the time limit. So let me now allow to conclude here with expectations that we all 
will enjoy the webinar very well and also in future in the academic program of our college we shall get the assistance of the today's speakers in future respecting this let me allow this stop here with a lot of thanks to all of you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir we are really very much we are feeling encouraged uh, your inspiration is always with us so that we can uh, we can uh, keep on doing these types of works again and again uh, now let me uh, invite our iqac coordinator the professor dr devashish bhoving uh, to have a little bit of uh, speech on this topic uh, professor devashish bhoving dr devashish bhoving shubho apuranno आयोजन अर्थनीति विभाग सकल के आंतरिक कृतज्ञता धन्यवाद सब चाहते बस धन्यवाद और कृतज्ञता सम्मानियों अतिथिरा आज के एवं कल के दिन वेबिनारे तर मूल्यवान बक्तव्य सुनिए कृतज्ञ करब कृतार्थ करबें तरह आगाम कलेज तरफ थे आईक्यूएस तरफ थे आंतरिक धन्यवाद जानी अर्थनीतर लोक नई साहित्य छात्र बांगला साहित्य छात्र फले अर्थनीतर गभरे को तत्व आलोचना कर क्षमता व योग्यता को नहीं पथ चलती मानुष आजकल कमे गे आजकल बसिभाग आलोचन छादे छादे एक जन मानुषर संगे और एक जन मानुषे छादे आलोचना कखो सको एक बड़ोले मुखे मुखावरण थे तरह आड़ाल दिए कतगुल कथा शना जाए कि आगे पर्त ओ हाइड्रक्सि क्लोरोकुईन आलोचना और ता नईले आर्सेंिका अलबाम थार्टिर आलोचना एगुल खूब चल रो इदानी से बंद हुए भैक्सिन चर्चा शुरू हो जगो साधारण मानुषर का कान आसान नियमित सुन जमन भैक्सिन ए भैक्सिन नहीं चर्चा चलते ये भैक्सिन तैरी करते गो विपुल अर्थर दरकार से अर्था कथा थे आसबे के जोगे हमें जानिना से भाव सरकारी बेसरकार उद्योग से आसबे कथागुल जो सुन तक मन हमें यह रकम कैकटा कथा जा रास्त घाटे शना जा कख कख छादे आलोचना विभिन्न स्तरे आलोचना से गो सुनो आगे एक उत्थापन करी एक बस समय अर्थनीति विभाग के अध्यापक डर चंदन राय दिए युकु अवकाश पासी प्रतिषेधक फर्मूला पेटेंट तरह रीति नीति की मैंने अन्न्य देश तारा की दामे से क्षमता आज कि ना सब देश से स्वयंभर की ना से केंार बेपारे से भावना चिंता करा उपादान दिए भैक्सिन गो तैरि तर उत्साटाई बा कथा थे आसबे तरह सोर्स की सब चाहते बड़ कथा मन है उत्पादन परिमाण नहीं परिकल्पना है मैं कौन देश कत तैरी कर चुक्ति है शुद्ध एन आविष्कार और गवेषणा आविष्कार और गवेषणा एक चक्र मध्य दिए जा दामी बाता नाना रकम जल्पना कल्पना चलते और से दूरदर्शन विभिन्न चैने से गो चर्बित चर्बण चलते तो यब थे एक जिन बार बार मन हेरा बोध एक विपुल अर्थनैतिक कर्मकांड मुखोमुखी होते चले साधारण मानुषर मुखे एकटाई तो कथा कि बाँचते तो बाँचाटाई ए सब चे बड़ कथा एन बेचे थका और सचल अर्थनीति दर मध्य एक सम्पर्क आई मुहूर्ते बाँचा मान कि बाँचा मान हम संक्रमण के क्यों ठेकानो जो पे मुश्किल हे अर्थनीति लकडाउनर मध्य आर एक भाषुभद्र सम्पर्क जदि लकडाउन तुले दी अर्थनीति सचल है लकडाउन जदि मैं ये कि लकडाउन जो आर नतून को चापिए दी तेल अर्थनीति थमके जा लकडाउन तुले दी संक्रमण बाढ़ मानुषर जीवन दा एस पड़े यम समस्या घुरपा घुरपा खाचे 
কিন্তু অনির্দিষ্ট কাল তো কোনো দেশে লকডাউন চালিয়ে যাওয়া যায় না এটা তো একটা না একটা সময় আমাদের বন্ধ করতে হবে ফলে আমরা হারে হারে বুঝতে পারছি যে করোনার সঙ্গে অর্থনীতির এখন একটা মানে কি বলবো মানে সরাসরি যুদ্ধ সরাসরি যুদ্ধ এসে হাজির হয়েছে এখন এই যে লকডাউন এই লকডাউনকে হয় ধীরে ধীরে বা আংশিক ভাবে বা সময়ান্তরে যেভাবেই হোক এটাকে তুলে মানে বন্ধ করতে হবে তুলে আনতে হবে বা সরিয়ে দিতে হবে তা ছাড়া তো কোনো উপায় নেই কেননা ইতিমধ্যে রিজার্ভ ব্যাংকের গভর্নর তিনি জানিয়েছেন যে দু হাজার কুড়ি সালেই ভারতবর্ষে অর্থনৈতিক বৃদ্ধির হার নাকি শূন্য নয় একেবারে ঋণাত্মক জায়গায় চলে যাবে সেটা খুব আমাদের কাছে আতঙ্কের এবং এই ভয়ানক পরিণতির কথা যখনই ভাবছি তখনই মনে হচ্ছে জানি না আমরা কোন ভারতবর্ষের দিকে এগোচ্ছি কোন দেশের দিকে এগোচ্ছি মানুষের আয় তো কমবেই কমবে ক্রয় ক্ষমতা মানুষের কেনার ক্ষমতা কমবে পণ্যের চাহিদা কমবে আয় কমেছে পণ্যের চাহিদা কমবে ফলে এর বিপদ সাংঘাতিক বিভিন্ন কল কারখানা ছোটখাটো বড় সব জায়গায় শ্রমিক ছাঁটাই হবে এগুলো থেকেও অর্থনীতি একটা জায়গায় একটা দুষ্ট চক্রের মধ্যে বন্দি হতে চলেছে আগামী দিনের অর্থনীতি এমন একটা আশঙ্কা প্রকাশ করছেন অর্থনীতির যারা দিকপাল পণ্ডিত তারা এবং তাদের সেই আশঙ্কার কথা সাধারণ মানুষের ধনী দরিদ্র নির্বিশেষে প্রত্যেকেই আমরা সেই রকম একটা আশঙ্কার মধ্যে দিয়ে এখন দিন যাপন করছি যে কি হবে আমাদের পরিস্থিতি কিন্তু এই পরিস্থিতি থেকে বেরিয়ে আসবার জন্য তো কিছু কিছু ভাবনা আমাদের ভাবতে হবে কারণ আজকে কোভিডের পরবর্তী পর্যায়ে ভারতবর্ষ পশ্চিমবঙ্গের অর্থনৈতিক যে সমস্যা এবং তা থেকে বেরিয়ে আসবার উপায় কি হবে এগুলো নিয়ে আজকে দুদিন ধরে আমাদের এই আলোচনা চক্র চলবে সুতরাং সেগুলো নিয়ে আমাদের কি কি সাধারণ মানুষ সাধারণ মানুষ হিসেবে আমরা কি কি ভাবছি মানে আমাদের কি মনে হচ্ছে যেমন অর্থনীতির সঙ্গে একেবারে কিছু বিষয় প্রত্যক্ষভাবে যুক্ত রয়েছে কিছু বিষয় পরোক্ষ হয়ে যুক্ত রয়েছে অর্থাৎ এই যে কোভিড পরবর্তী পরিস্থিতি তার সঙ্গে অর্থনীতির একটা প্রত্যক্ষ যোগাযোগ একটা পরোক্ষ যোগাযোগ এই দুটো যোগাযোগের কথা আমি একটু উল্লেখ করব খুব পরোক্ষ যোগাযোগ যেমন এই মুহূর্তে মাস্ক বা স্যানিটাইজার সেইগুলোর তার যে প্রয়োজনীয়তা রয়েছে সেটা উৎপাদনের দিকটা সরকার কি ভাবছে তার পাশাপাশি বেসরকারি উদ্যোগের কথা কি ভাবা হচ্ছে স্বাস্থ্য ব্যবস্থা এবং তার বিভিন্ন পরিকাঠামো উন্নততর করতে হবে কারণ দেশ বিদেশের শিল্পপতিদের সাহায্য নেওয়া চাওয়া যেতে পারে কারণ স্বাস্থ্য ব্যবস্থা পরিকাঠামো উন্নয়ন না করলে পরে এই মুহূর্তে যা চলছে অর্থাৎ আমাদের যা যে পরিমাণ কোভিড পেশেন্টদের থাকবার জন্য যে ব্যবস্থা তাদেরকে সেবা শুশ্রূষা দেবার জন্য যে ব্যবস্থা তা যথেষ্ট প্রতুল নয় ফলে আমাদের চেষ্টা করতে হবে যাতে আরো সেটাকে বাড়ানো যায় আরো বেশি ডাক্তার আরো বেশি নার্স তাদেরকে যাতে প্রোভাইড করা যায় সেই চেষ্টাটা আমাদের করতে হবে সাহায্য নিতে তো ক্ষতি নেই রবীন্দ্রনাথ তো বিশ্বভারতী প্রতিষ্ঠার সময় শিল্পপতিদের কাছে সাহায্য পেয়েছিলেন সুতরাং সরকারের কাছে এইরকম একটা ভালো কাজে সাহায্য বেসরকারি উদ্যোগ থেকে চেয়ে নেওয়া এমন কিছু কঠিন কাজ নয় হাসপাতাল নার্স ওষুধপত্র যন্ত্রপাতি এগুলোর উৎপাদন বাড়াতে হবে এগুলো কিন্তু পরোক্ষ অর্থনীতির বিষয়গুলো নিয়ে আমি বলছি কর্মক্ষেত্রে শারীরিক দূরত্বের বিষয়টাকে কিন্তু সরকারি তরফে আরো গভীরভাবে ভাবতে হবে ওই শুধুমাত্র দুদিন কান ধরে লকডাউনের মধ্যে বেরোলো কান ধরে ওঠানো বসানো করলো এটা করলে হবে না এটা নিয়মিত একটা আমাদের কি বলবো সার্ভিলেন্সের মধ্যে রাখতে হবে যাতে আমরা এই দূরত্ব বজায় রেখে সমস্তটা করতে পারি এবং সংক্রমণটা যাতে না ছড়ায় সংক্রমণ ছড়ালে কিন্তু তার প্রভাব ভয়ঙ্কর মানুষের জীবনের ওপর তার দায় এসে পড়বে এবার আসি অর্থনীতির সঙ্গে প্রত্যক্ষভাবে যুক্ত যে বিষয়গুলো সেই বিষয়গুলো প্রথমেই বলবো আমি পরিযায়ী শ্রমিকদের কথা কারণ অসংগঠিত ক্ষেত্রে ভারতবর্ষে মোটামুটি যা শ্রমিক আছে সেই শ্রমিকদের একটা বড় অংশ বিভিন্ন রাজ্য থেকে আমাদের রাজ্যে চলে এসছে বা অন্যান্য রাজ্যও হয়তো গেছে পঞ্চান্ন কোটি উনষাট লক্ষ ভারতবর্ষের এখন শ্রমিক যা টেন পার্সেন্ট মাত্র সংগঠিত ক্ষেত্রে কাজ করে বাকি বৃহৎ সংখ্যক হচ্ছে অসংগঠিত ক্ষেত্রের শ্রমিক এই অসংগঠিত ক্ষেত্রে শ্রমিকরা যদি বসে যায় তাহলে তারা যে অর্থনীতি যে আমাদের সে সচল অর্থনীতি তার উপর কিন্তু প্রত্যক্ষভাবে প্রভাব ফেলবে তাই অসংগঠিত শ্রমিকদের ভালো মন্দের দিকটা নিয়ে কেন্দ্র এবং রাজ্য উভয় সরকারকেই আমাদের চিন্তা করতে হবে পরিযায়ী শ্রমিক নিয়ে একটা সমস্যা তৈরি হয়েছিল কিছুদিন আগে তো আমরা সকলেই জেনেছি সেই ট্রেনে তারা আসবে কে এইটি ফাইভ পার্সেন্ট দেবে কে ফিফটি পার্সেন্ট দেবে এই নিয়ে একটা তরজাও হলো এই সব তরজা যেন আর কখনো না হয় এগুলো কাম্য নয় এটা আমাদের ভাবতে হবে লকডাউনের মধ্যে তারা যাতে খেয়ে পড়ে বেঁচে থাকে তার জন্য কেন্দ্রীয় সরকার এবং রাজ্য সরকার তারা বেশ কিছু উদ্যোগ গ্রহণ করেছেন একটা রেশনিং সিস্টেমের ব্যবস্থা করেছেন সেটা খুব ভালো ব্যবস্থা কিন্তু পাশাপাশি দেখতে হবে তাদের বাড়িতে তাদের যে সন্তানেরা রয়েছে তারা যথাযথভাবে শিক্ষার সুযোগটা পাচ্ছে কিনা কারণ যেহেতু একটা শিক্ষা প্রতিষ্ঠানে আমরা এই আলোচনা চক্র আয়োজন
বড় এবং মাঝারি শিল্পগুলো আবার যাতে একটু একটু করে চালু হতে পারে সরকারকে সেই উদ্যোগ নিতে হবে মনে রাখতে হবে যে এই শ্রমিকদের কিন্তু তাদের নিজেদের কাজের জায়গাটা ফিরিয়ে দিতে হবে তা নইলে কিন্তু অর্থনীতি আবার একটা জায়গায় শেওলার মতো জমে যাবে এবং যখনই বড় এবং মাঝারি শিল্পকে আবার চালু করা যাবে দেখা যাবে তার সঙ্গে তার যে ছোট ছোট তার সঙ্গে সংলগ্ন শিল্পগুলো সেই শিল্পগুলো আবার পুনরুজ্জীবিত হতে শুরু করেছে এবং আবার একটা সচল অর্থনীতির ব্যবস্থা সেটা আমাদের রাজ্যে বা ভারতবর্ষে সেটা চালু হয়েছে আজকেই কাগজে দেখছিলাম একটা ভয়ঙ্কর খবর যে রিজার্ভ ব্যাংকের যে গভর্নর তিনি আজকে জানিয়েছেন একটা খবর যে যদি কেউ মার্চ মাসের এক তারিখ পর্যন্ত তাদের যে ঋণ ছিল সেই ঋণটা যদি তার প্রদেয় ঋণ শোধের অর্থ দিয়ে গিয়ে থাকে তাহলে এই প্যান্ডেমিকের পর্যায়েও তারা যদি আবার ঋণের জন্য আবেদন করে তাদের ঋণ দেয়া যেতে পারে অর্থাৎ এই ধরনের যারা যারা ঋণ ঠিকঠাক করে শোধ করে তাদেরকে যেমন ঋণ দেওয়ার ব্যবস্থাটা আবার চালু করা যেতে পারে সেটা একটা খুব ভালো উদ্যোগ আজকের খবরে কাগজে দেখছিলাম পাশাপাশি যারা ঋণ নেয়নি তাদের ক্ষেত্রেও কিন্তু নতুন কোন প্রকল্পের কথা ভাবনা চিন্তা করা যেতে পারে শিক্ষা প্রতিষ্ঠানের যেহেতু এইটা একটা ওয়েবিনার তারই শিক্ষার কথা বলে আমি শেষ করব যে লকডাউন পরিস্থিতিতে একটা অনলাইনে পড়াশুনোর একটা আমাদের প্রথা শুরু হয়েছে এখন কথা হচ্ছে এই লকডাউনে পড়াশুনোটা ভারতবর্ষে ইন্টারনেট কানেকশন কতজনের আছে এটা আমাদের একটা খুব বড় ভাইটাল প্রশ্ন মনে রাখতে হয় মাত্র টোয়েন্টি সেভেন পার্সেন্ট এই সাতাশ শতাংশ সাতাশ শতাংশ মানুষের কাছে এই ইন্টারনেট কানেকশন আছে এটা কি যথেষ্ট এই অনলাইন পড়াশোনার ক্ষেত্রে কি যথেষ্ট সহায়ক হতে পারে তা না তা হতে পারে না ফলে এটা একটা সমস্যা তাহলে প্রত্যেককে অনলাইন পড়াশোনার সুযোগ যাতে দেওয়া যায় তার জন্য অর্থ বরাদ্দ হোক কেন্দ্রীয় বা রাজ্য সরকারের স্তরে তাদের ব্যয় বরাদ্দ কিভাবে তারা করবেন সেটা নিয়ে একটা ভাবনা চিন্তা করা যেতে পারে দ্বিতীয়ত অনলাইন মনে রাখতে হবে যে অনলাইন লেখাপড়া কিন্তু কখনোই শ্রেণীকক্ষের যে লেখাপড়া তার সমান্তরাল হতে পারে না কিন্তু এই যে পরিস্থিতি এই পরিস্থিতিতে ছাত্রছাত্রীদের মধ্যে তারা তো ছোট তাদের মধ্যে যদি সংক্রমণের হারটা ছড়িয়ে যায় তাহলে সেটা কিন্তু খুব বিপজ্জনক মানে সমাজের সর্বস্তরে সেটা ছড়িয়ে যাবে এই কথাটা কিন্তু আমাদের ভাবতে হবে স্মার্টফোন কেনার ক্ষমতা ইন্টারনেট নেবার ক্ষমতা ফেসবুক ব্যবহারের ন্যূনতম যোগ্যতা এই সমস্ত বিষয়গুলো কিন্তু মাথায় রেখেই আমাদের পরবর্তী যে পদক্ষেপগুলো সেগুলো নিতে হবে তাহলে সরকারের পক্ষ থেকে কি কি করণীয় মানে যেগুলো আমরা সাধারণ মানুষ হিসেবে রাস্তায় ঘাটে শুনছি বা বিভিন্ন বন্ধু বান্ধবদের সঙ্গে আলোচনায় জানতে পারছি সেগুলো যে সরকারি বাজেটে ব্যয় বরাদ্দ তো বাড়াতেই হবে বিশেষ করে শিক্ষা ক্ষেত্রের যে ব্যয় বরাদ্দ সেটা এত লজ্জাজনক এতই লজ্জাজনক যে শিক্ষা ক্ষেত্রে ব্যয় বরাদ্দ বাড়ানোটা ভীষণ রকম জরুরি বলে ব্যক্তিগত ভাবে আমার মনে মনে হয় এটা বলাই বাহুল্য তাছাড়া বাজেট যদি ঘাটতি বাজেটও কোনো সময় হয় তাহলে বিধি বহির্ভূত যে তহবিল সেই বিধি বহির্ভূত তহবিল থেকে নগ টাকা কিন্তু তুলে দিতে হবে যারা যেসব শ্রমিকেরা এখনো কাজে ফিরে যেতে পারছে না তাদের জন্য এবং তাদের সন্তানদের শিক্ষায় যাতে তারা ব্যয় করতে পারে সেই জন্য নগদ অর্থ তুলে দেওয়ার একটা প্রস্তাব অনেক মহল থেকে উঠে আসছে এটা জরুরি প্রযুক্তিতে উৎপাদনশীলতা এই সময় খুব দরকার প্রযুক্তির উৎপাদনশীলতা ল্যাব নেই করোনা টেস্টের ব্যবস্থা নেই বিভিন্ন রকম পিপি যেগুলো তৈরি করা যেতে পারে সেগুলোর তৈরির ব্যবস্থা নেই এগুলোকে নিয়ে সরকারকে ভাবতে হবে যাতে সব ছাত্রছাত্রীর হাতে একটা এই কাজের জন্য খুব কম দামের হলেও একটি স্মার্টফোন তুলে দেওয়া যায় তার ব্যবস্থা করতে হবে তা নইলে তো স্বাস্থ্যসম্মত শ্রেণী শিক্ষা আমরা এই মুহূর্তে তুলে চালু করতে পারছি না মনে রাখতে হবে যে আঠেরো থেকে তেইশ বা চব্বিশ বছর বয়সী যারা তাদের মধ্যে মিডিয়া ব্যবহারকারীর সংখ্যা হচ্ছে চোদ্দ কোটি বাইশ লক্ষ এদের মধ্যে কলেজ বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে পড়ে তিন কোটি চুয়াত্তর লক্ষ এই তিন কোটি চুয়াত্তর লক্ষ যে ছাত্রছাত্রী তাদেরকে অনলাইন পড়ানোর যে ব্যবস্থা সেই ব্যবস্থার মধ্যে আনাটা খুব মুখের কথা নয় কাজেই শুধুমাত্র জাতীয় শিক্ষানীতি ঘোষণা করে জাতীয় শিক্ষানীতির কতগুলো তার মধ্যে বেশ কিছু বিষয়কে যুক্ত করেই আমরা শান্তি দিতে পারি না তার পাশাপাশি আমাদের মনে রাখতে হবে যে এই মুহূর্তে অনলাইন শিক্ষার প্রসার এবং তার জন্য তা যা করণীয় শিক্ষা ক্ষেত্রে ব্যয় বরাদ্দ যতটা বাড়ানো উচিত সেগুলো সবটাই আমাদের করতে হবে এইভাবে একটা সামগ্রিক পরিকল্পনা যদি অর্থনীতিবিদেরা নেন তাহলে আমার মনে হয় যে আগামী দিনে আমরা এই যে এখন যে পরিস্থিতিতে চ্যালেঞ্জের মুখোমুখি হয়েছি এই চ্যালেঞ্জ থেকে আমরা একটু একটু করে কয়েক ধাপ এগোতে পারবো এটাই আমার প্রত্যয়
আইকুয়েসির পক্ষ থেকে কালিয়াগঞ্জ কলেজের আমি আবার সম্মানিত যে অতিথিরা আজ দুদিন ধরে আমাদের এখানে বলবেন তাদের প্রত্যেককে কলেজের পক্ষ থেকে আন্তরিক কৃতজ্ঞতা ও ধন্যবাদ জানিয়ে আমি আমার বক্তব্য এখানে শেষ করছি ধন্যবাদ 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 অধ্যাপক ডক্টর দেবশীষ ভৌমিক মহাশয়কে ইন্টারনাল কোয়ালিটি এসুরেন্স সেলের তরফ থেকে বক্তব্য রাখলেন তিনি নাও উই উইল স্টার্ট आवर ওয়েবিনার নাও দ্য কিনোট অ্যাড্রেস উইল বি উইল বি ডেলিভারড বাই आवर প্রফেসর সঞ্চরি রায় মুখার্জি আই हैव অলরেডি স্পোকেন দ্যাট শি ইজ মাই পিএইচডি সুপারভাইজার Uh, she is also dean faculty council of pg studies in arts commerce and law north bengal university and also professor of department of economics from north bengal university she will deliver her lecture on a glimpse of indian economy and its pandemic madam thank madam you. can you hear me yes can okay. you hear me clearly yeah, yeah yes yes ma'am okay okay now the stage is uh, yours thank you thank you so much um a uh, very good afternoon to all the listeners and the attendees firstly i'm really thankful uh, to the principal of kalia gaunch college so dinachpur dr pk das to have invited me to this webinar on post covid situations in indian and west bengal economy challenges and remedies I'm also thankful to IQAC coordinator Dr. Devashish Bhome uh, of the college and of course my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Chandan Rai the convener of the webinar and other esteemed members of the organizing committee in fact both uh, Dr. Das and Dr. Bhome have spoken at length regarding some of the most relevant issues uh, that we are facing today that the economy is facing today and that we as commoners are also facing today uh i'm uh, extend my heartiest greetings to my co speakers um professor ajita borai choudhury of jadavpur university and professor shrikant sinha roy of also jadavpur university uh professor bihar shah of durham university business school durham university and professor orijita dotto of calcutta university and professor pakshapur timpal of iim calcutta now this virtual seminar or webinar as it is called actually is indeed uh, quite a novel idea for us academics now since it has brought all the interested on the same platform and across all geographical boundaries without actually being physically present in the seminar hall which of course i miss very much now at the outset i would like to mention that um, as economists so we tend to use facts and figures uh, to validate our arguments and i'll be approaching in the same manner however i'll be using only gross some of the gross statistics that i've come across again however i'm uh, since i'm the first speaker of today's webinar i'm taking the opportunity to provide an overview uh, of the indian economic situation uh, during the pandemic and finally end with some of the policy measures that have been undertaken to overcome this crisis uh now india located in south asia is the as we all are all aware of is the seventh largest country in the world by area and the second most populous country behind only china so presently india's population has grown to 1.33 billion So for a country to grow first thing utilization of its existing resources in the most efficient manner is a necessity and so is the distribution of its resources to ensure distributive justice and inclusive growth for all at the same time for development to occur it is imperative that uh, the human resources or the citizens are provided with health and education by the state that may be considered as entitlements of the citizen following a motion now beyond this for a country to achieve economic stability it is important that it can sustain price stability sustain a low unemployment rate 
create increasing income earning opportunities and a favorable balance of trade so these are the basic features of a developing economy which we are all aware of now besides this of course with demographic transition it is observed that the services sector becomes the primary provider of job opportunities followed by industrial sector wherein manufacturing assumes more importance and finally it is the agricultural sector in india between 2008 and 2018 the sectoral share of these major sectors to the gdp or the gross domestic product were 49% for services 27% of for industry and 15% for agriculture and agriculture engages around 60% of the population but it contributes the lowest because it does not produce high much high value commodities thus india has experienced the shrinking of the agricultural sector and expanding uh, and an expansion in the industry and services sector as is expected from a developing economy further the indian economy has been subject to considerate considerable growth during the liberalization period in the early 1990s india's gdp growth rate has consistently been well above 5% for the last 10 years so as a result of this growth the country's gdp was ranked the sixth largest in the world till 2017 now part of the reason as mentioned for india's success is the economic liberalization that started in 1991 that encourage trade and subsequently ending some public monopolies now gdp growth has slowed down in recent years due in part to skyrocketing inflation india's workforce has been expanding in the industrial and services sector growing partially because of international outsourcing a profitable venture for the indian economy the agricultural sector in india is still a global top is producing more wheat or tea than anyone in the world except for china regarding tea however with the mechanization of a lot of processes and with the rapidly growing population india's unemployment rate remains relatively high now given this very sketchy background let us turn to 2020 covid-19 in all its ugliness has impacted all walks of life bringing life itself to a standstill the global economy is in shambles and very judicious steps need to be taken for the world to make a turn around india is no exception if gdp is considered to be a good indicator of where the country is heading india's quarterly gdp was estimated to decline of over 9% that is minus 9.3% between april and june 2020 this was a decrease from a 5% growth in the beginning of 2020 the country went into lockdown on march 25 the largest in the world in fact locking down 1.3 billion people this was extended until may 3 2020 <clears throat> although ecorap that is the sbi research report earlier in may had estimated that the first quarter of the financial year 20 2021 the gdp contraction will be over 20% but however it has maintained a 16.5% contraction in april to june quarter according to the sbi research report now the virus actually has been found to have infected indiscriminately but it it was found to have different effects on different groups communities ethnicities ethnicities but a stark divide has emerged with regard to gender now besides the impact on health the pandemic has a severe impact on long term economic prospects which i intend to highlight now while i'm going to not going to dwell upon the global issue I would just like to mention that the impact of the coronavirus pandemic had not only brought the global economy to a standstill but set the clock backwards 
on the development progress of several nations. Now, while the rate of infection in India did not appear to be as high as in other countries initially, the precautionary measures adopted dealt a severe blow to the country's major industries, like, for example, with finance, real estate, and professional services, they have borne the largest brunt at an estimated loss of 17.3%. Now, having said this, let us now see what are the aspects in, the, in our working lives that have been affected by the pandemic under lockdown and post-lockdown. Now, coronavirus, as we are all aware by this time, is a contagious disease. And without any vaccine or assured medication, we are to maintain social distancing and keep ourselves safe by following certain rules or isolate ourselves and quarantine ourselves if, uh, there are, if there is a fear of endangering other people's lives. Our mobility has been highly restricted and we are living a life of uncertainty and fear. Now, in this context, the first question that leaps to our mind is which are the economic sectors that will be most affected by the pandemic and ensuing lockdown and while maintaining virtually no contact with another individual. Now, while we salute the frontliners like the doctors, nurses, sanitation workers, and the health workers like the ASHA workers, we must concede that without their active presence and braving the odds of getting infected, life will cease to exist. That is, thus, it is important that we value their contribution with respect and gratitude. Interestingly, with the rapid increase in the number of affected, the deficiencies and the inadequacies in the health sector have become starkly visible. Now, on a lighter note, let me digress a bit to our daily life during the pandemic and especially under lockdown. Let us take a glance at some statistics which has been provided by Statista. By, uh, they have collected this data through a survey of some, some individuals, um, a group of individuals around 8,000 in India. But it is an interesting feature which I want to focus because it is a part of our own life which we are faced. In the first, the statistics of the various activities involved during the lockdown. Activities which we would not have otherwise undertaken. Now, this is because activities that we used to undertake before the onslaught of the virus and the subsequent lockdown and the phase wise unlockdown have undergone a distinctive change. Now, what we find is that the results of the survey show a spike in the involvement of household chores as a result of the coronavirus lockdown across India in April 2020. Other popular activities included watching movies and TV shows online, exercising at home, and making video calls to family and friends, and posting at length on the social media. Now, along with this, I would also like to mention the digitalization process that is taking place in our life, something that Dr. Bhomik mentioned. Now, digital payments for groceries, medicines in retail stores in India as of April 2020 accounted for 35% of the surveyed population as, as shown by Statista. And statistics show that the consumer market that is least affected is the telecom market. Again, coming back to economics, household income in India was drastically impacted due to the coronavirus lockdown as of April 12, 2020. There was a significant decrease in the level of income with households reporting a fall in income from about 9% in late February to a whooping 45.7% in mid-April. The rise in income saw a slowing down from 31% in late February to 10% on April 12, 2020. Now, again, uh, a survey by Rakuten Insight on panic buying after the coronavirus outbreak. 81% of the Indian respondents stated 
that they felt safe after stop signing on items and in the same survey the majority of respondents who engaged in panic buying stocked up on dry food items personal hygiene products and medical supplies indicating that these are the products will be the highest selling which will acquire the highest selling figures now due to measures uh, so introduced to curb uh, the spread of the coronavirus in india residential mobility also saw a decline in june compared to april 2020 the biggest industry in india is retail which makes up almost a quarter of the nation's gdp now retail and recreation had the steepest decline as 67% in june compared to the baseline periods in january and february with easing of restrictions since the end of may workplaces saw an increase in mobility that month although there is a still declining trend compared to the baseline period now looking at our immediate environment while every member of the family was confined at home during the lockdown each member depending on their age gender and work engagement expended their time according to their own needs and requirements for example a woman's care work including household chores has risen many fold had risen many fold restricting restricting her own time and space thus this unpaid care work unless shared by other members takes a toll on their personal health and also on their efficacy while having to work from home and work for home in the absence of domestic help which amount which uh, according to figures are 80% of them are being women who were also under lockdown and confined at home women of the household were overburdened with care giving and simultaneously many women have lost their jobs as domestic help belonging to the informal sector even in post lockdown situation this has happened since the apprehension of getting infected in the family with children and elderly has eliminated the possibility of retaining them in the service in the long run now it is widely discussed that the informal sector or the unorganized sector has been gravely affected in terms of the loss in employment now informal activities are distinct from formal ones and researchers opine that informal sector provides a temporary safety net to the poor during economic crisis where crisis is often referred to a recession war situation natural calamity resulting in an economic crisis however a calamity or crisis of this proportion a fallout of the covid-19 caught the economy unprepared to deal with sectors that are low valued and employ no human capital and the fact remains that poverty is the result of low levels of human capital which has reached its staggering height during the pandemic another sector which has been very hard hit is the construction sector or the real estate in fact the largest organized market by value in india is construction however a large number of men and women are employed as construction workers in the informal sector with construction operations coming to a halt the backward linkages created by the sector namely the suppliers of the raw materials and their workers have suffered an insurmountable loss thus coronavirus has dealt a severe blow to certain major industries that constitute the economy's lifeline coming to the impact on tea industry the loss incurred by enforcing this is the world bank figures we are giving by enforcing a lockdown in the country was estimated at 26 billion us dollars and a significant decline in gdp growth was evident in the june quarter of 2020 with the imposition of restrictions on transportation worldwide the trade sector also took a hit exports and imports saw a drastic decline in the country especially in the case of essential commodities such as petroleum food crops and coal among others 
Now let us look at the effect on businesses in India. The supply chain has been severely disrupted, as mentioned earlier, with the with the lockdown. Now many startups, small and medium enterprises, were expected to supply increase in demand. The effects of aid from the government was until April, arguably. Deemed inadequate in the face of a faltering economy. Again, experts opine that the growth rate of the automotive business in India was expected to be most adversely affected, followed by the power sector and the IT sectors. More recently, India has developed a reputation of a breeding ground for IT specialists. and the relatively low wage levels make India a popular destination for outsourcing the it industry in india is continuing to surge with over 143 billion us dollars worth of revenue generated in 2017 contributing a considerable amount to the country's overall gdp and with the deleterious impact of covid 19 19 lockdown on this industry the economy is bound to stagger aviation tourism and hospitality have also been hit severely leaving many many people jobless while the growth rate is the is in the negative in the first quarter of financial year 21 as i mentioned earlier let us see which sectors had registered the least growth as mentioned earlier the financial real estate and professional services experienced a negative growth of 17.3% mining and quarrying minus 14.7% electricity gas water supply and other utility services minus 13.9% construction minus 13.3% trade hotels transport communication and broadcasting services 9.7% and the overall growth in value addition as mentioned earlier is minus 9.3% uh as mentioned earlier the estimated cost of full lockdown has been 26 billion usd and the value of the government aid to combat the covid-19 in india is 348 billion indian rupees to combat the effects of coronavirus lockdown as of may 6 2020 the largest value under the package went towards payments to farmers under the pm kisan prime minister kisan scheme and women account holders of the pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana the relief package falls under the pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana scheme with a commitment of about 1.7 trillion rupees as relief for this time however a large segment of the population still lie outside the ambit and would need support the coronavirus had been the center of the loss of lives and livelihoods on a massive scale in india the economy alongside the population also requires nursing back to health let us look back a little the lockdown came at a time when the economy was already struggling trade across sectors was estimated to be impacted this directly affected the procurement of essential items including testing equipment so besides the import and export business yet another major revenue generator that received a blow was the tourism industry india's predominantly unorganized retail market was yet another casualty with the lockdown increasing the pressure on the online retail segment to rise to the occasion but one must admit that the round the corner mom and pop stores have thrived very well and have catered to our daily grocery needs again in the retail food and beverage sales growth growth in health and hygiene products is expected to register a rise in sales e-commerce is on the rise too however the other retail businesses will be hard hit because of avoidance of visit to the stores and predominance of the health issues in our life our spending behavior is also going to change and has been changing global online traffic has increased by leaps and bounds 
the various apps have registered a huge demand. Companies, companies offering digital payment services such as Paytm, Google Pay, appear to have somewhat benefited from the situation. This includes grocery delivery apps and online grocery orders. In fact, surveys have shown the dependence on local retail, which increased by 41% based on the survey again by Statista. Shopping malls are experiencing insignificant number of footfalls, and very soon, retail business in such supermarkets and malls will experience a severe setback in spite of the unlocked down. The shopping malls presently look like banquet hall deserted. Those who are employed there will be laid off to cut down the cost. However, the pandemic has brought out the worst of our public health care system. While the economy was one thing, while the impact on the economy was one thing, but putting lives at risk and bringing the health care to the forefront was another aspect. As access to proper health care services was a major concern within India, irrespective of the pandemic. As of 2018, public health expenditure was valued at nearly 1.6 trillion Indian rupees. Since government health facilities were the more affordable option for a majority of the population, with the spread of the virus, it put tremendous pressure on the existing healthcare services. Thus, it is a lesson to, to be learned that public or social expenditure should be given primacy over others to combat such unforeseen pandemic. Finally, let us now observe the dislocations in employment scenario to the invisible enemy. A society where a large proportion of the adult population join the labor force, and almost all who do join the labor force are fully employed, is a society that is largely healthy and free of economic vulnerability. Such a society automatically motivates households to spend more to improve their quality of life. In doing so, households propel economic growth and more employment. A society that cannot provide gainful employment to those who seek it, on the other hand, is vulnerable. An increase in unemployment reduces aggregate spending power, slows down the economy, and most importantly, it increases the vulnerability of households to deal with economic shocks. In 2019, 43% of the workforce in India were employed in agriculture, while the other half was almost evenly distributed among the two other sectors, that is industry and services. Now, unemployment, which was at 7.60% in December 2019, as per CMI, Control for Monitoring, a Center for Monitoring Indian, Indian, Indian Enterprises um, figures, CMI figures, registered an increase to around 24% in May 2020. Uh, urban unemployment figures were at 9% and 26% respectively. Unemployment rate has since then been registering a fall. In July, it was 7.5 percent, and and presently it stands at 8.2 percent as of 23rd August 2020. It is further estimated that the 18.9 million salary jobs were hit during the lockdown, as per the Center for Monitoring Indian Economies. Uh, consumer Pyramids Household Survey estimates nearly 17 million salary jobs were lost in April-June quarter. MSM, MSMEs are also suffering from huge losses with soaring non-performing assets. The business houses who can operate with least contact will ensure fewer people on their office premises, and therefore there will be further job cuts in their own sectors. There will also be revenue losses in the sports industry. That includes the industry producing sports gear. In fact, for the first time, Wimbledon has tumbled down in history. 
The monetary aid and the aid in kind announced recently by the government also brings some relief. It is surely not enough. The problem currently is not so much with the supply chain, but with the demand. Lack of purchasing power coupled with the rise in the unemployed will cause the demand to shrink. Once there is a lower defective demand, production is expected to fall in the next few months with fall in wages and lowering employment opportunities. Following OBG Vinay Banerjee's words, one needs to have money in hand to boost the demand, which is one significant way to revive the retail and other businesses. The Center for Monitoring Indian Economy provided the disturbing figures in May itself that 12 crore 20 lakh workforce has been rendered jobless. The migrant workers who have returned to their origin had taken a big leap walking hundreds of miles in distress and now since are coming to their fate. But with no remittances, no jobs, no savings to fall back upon, these families are in deep poverty. In economic insecurity of majority of the people in India and the rest of South Asia are now a major concern. So finally, as a final word, it is essential to ameliorate the economic distress that both men and women are subject to, supporting livelihoods and families in distress. COVID-19 will have a long-term impact on the economy, on the society, communities, livelihoods, and on both the gender and on gender relations. Lack of gender-responsive pandemic control policies will put the economy into deep trouble again. On the optimistic note, India hopefully will adopt policies that will ensure the retention of the workforce by providing support to businesses to recover the loss, besides what has been provided to the MSMEs. People need to be fed before they can think of other things. Even a capitalist economy like the U.S. can adopt a policy of supporting industry financially to ensure non-retrenchment and retention of workforce. And it is unacceptable that a country that still has a socialist in the preamble of the Constitution cannot think more proactively. And that assurance that is basic for survival is of utmost urgency along with the assistance of getting proper and adequate healthcare services during the pandemic. Policy responses by the government must be grounded in human, women, and labor and child rights. The government of West Bengal has announced yesterday that the government has directly remitted Rs. 1,882 crores to 39 lakh beneficiaries across the 23 districts of the state. The Honorable Chief Minister calls this historic. It indeed is. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your mesmeric and illuminating speech. Uh, so, Professor Shantari Roy Mukherjee has just opened the uh, discussion chest uh, with her keynote address. Uh, and uh, very soon we will now uh, go to our technical session one. Uh, Professor Rosita Borajodri is already amongst us. I welcome Professor Rosita Borajodri, who is uh, who was uh, professor my university professor in my university days, uh, and he will speak on COVID nineteen and economic rejuvenation challenges ahead. So. I would like to ask Professor Ozita Haroos Raishodhuri to unmute your microphone and be visible to us. Professor Ozita Raishodhuri. Thank you, Chandan, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, the Kaliaganj College, for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure uh, to keep a request from ex students, and Chandan is one of them, and he keeps uh, constant touch with me on various uh, things. and. Uh, I was just waiting for that when he will come back with COVID and uh, its problems, and he did. So it's a pleasure for me to come here and address uh, this issue of uh, economic rejuvenation and uh, uh, possible uh, measures for this economic rejuvenation. And inter alia, if I can touch upon West Bengal, that will be good. In fact, I will. 
Now, let me uh, just begin with this, that uh, a lot of people uh, try to compare it with disasters which world faced economic disasters in history. And naturally, we have a number of disasters. In fact, we had, uh, uh, I don't want to go back to Spanish flu, but in fact, something which all of us read in our textbooks and otherwise is the Great Depression of 1929. And then we had this, uh, you know, devastation of World War, and then we had this uh, uh, periodic crisis which affects the, uh, what we say, the world at large, and especially the capitalist economies. And uh, I don't want to mention the names, uh, you know, one by one, but the fact remains that uh, there's a difference between, say, uh, what we had this uh, Great Depression of the 1929, which continued to the 30s. Uh, the, the difference is that people, uh, what happened is the factories were all there. They were not producing. People lost their jobs. There's a crisis of what we say the effective demand or aggregate demand. We had the John Maynard Keynes. We had his prescriptions, and which I guess is uh, uh, very relevant these days too. But the difference of this uh, calamity which we had, uh, the economic calamity, if we can say so, from the current scenario, the similarity is that the factories are all there. It's not like a war that factories are ravaged. The factories are all standing there, but uh, the gates are locked. A lot of workers are not getting jobs, and uh, uh, this is this this is this is uh, similar to the Great Depression. But the difference is this health pandemic. So there is a health contagion which has affected the world, and along that we have this economic contagion in the sense that if there is a crisis, some part of the world. Uh, it started with China, of course, and I will bring back this topic, uh, this this particular aspect later on. But the fact remains that if there is something, some disturbance at some part of the world, it's contagious. So health contagion is one aspect. Economic contagion is the other aspect. And obviously what happened in 29, the difference is we are more intertwined in trade and investment relations globally. So the, the difference is very important that uh, the, the interdependence of the world has gone up in terms of economics and this uncertain health pandemic, which is completely new dimension, which was not there in depression. So we can suggest a number of things to get the economy out, but we must keep in mind that this particular health pandemic, which we are having, we don't know when that will end. The pandits differ so much in terms of when the vaccine will be there, whether that will be effective at all, the vaccine will be, uh, will be you know, discovered effectively or not. So naturally, when there is this health pandemic breathing uh, upon your shoulder, the, uh, in one word, if I can sum it up, how it differs from this Great Depression, for example, is that in Great Depression, you are uncertainty. You don't know when the job will, uh, you will get back. And that uncertainty may have gone up fivefold in this case because of this health uncertainty. So we have to keep in mind the whole world is suffering from this uncertainty, which is multiplied so many times than what we have seen earlier. And that's my starting point. When you have this kind of economic, uh, you can say a recessionary trend, whether it's depression or not, I'm not going to this, uh, you know, this nomenclature type of debate. The fact is people have lost their jobs. There is uncertainty. But this uncertainty about health, uh, what the economy will be heading to and how they will tackle this health uncertainty. So if you combine this, this, uh, you know, magnitude of uncertainty, which we are facing now, I don't think in 100 years of history, which we can think about, we have faced this. So given this, the kind of things which we are talking about, that how the economy can be rejuvenated, the common thing which comes to mind, and that's also taking the one part of the similarity, that's kind of a great depression, is what the Keynesian prescription. 
fiscal intervention. So uh, a, a large scale fiscal intervention, assuming that the multipliers will work, certainly will shift the aggregate demand curve because it has already shifted inwards in the sense that aggregate demand has fallen, uh, it will push it back. So the remedy is a well-known, well-beaten path, I would say, the Keynesian uh, strategy. But uh, the fact remains that in the Keynesian strategy, which we talk about, we don't take explicitly the uncertainty component. And we don't take, although this was a part of uh, this whole Keynesian economics, which we are right now knowingly or unknowingly following, is a question of income distribution. In fact, if one carefully thinks about this, these two things, a very high degree of uncertainty and a worsening income distribution leads to a value of multiplier, which is certainly much less than what the in standard Keynesian prescription we think about. I'm not saying that, say, uh, all this uh, uh, policy planners or uh, bureaucrats or politicians in India are absolutely oblivious of this fact, and economists also. But the, 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 the important thing is one has to think about these two particular aspects which I just mentioned, a very high degree of uncertainty and a worsening income distribution, how much the multiplier will be. So suppose if the multiplier is three, if you push in 100 rupees, it will be 300 rupees. Assuming that leakage and etc. I'm not going into this. Suppose this leakage and etc. are already taken care of. But the standard multiplier, the story is not, uh, you know, it's kind of a certainty type of economy where, uh, you know, the multiplier works without uh, any possible hindrance. And then uh, obviously assuming the income distribution is unchanged. That's what the multiplier is. That's what the Keynesian fiscal uh, stimulus is based upon. I'm not saying Keynes was uh, oblivious of this fact. I mean, Keynes didn't take care of this uncertainty. But the, but, but the way this whole textbook scenario is built up is certain world and a fa uh, you know unchanged income distribution. Both of these are changing. Both of these, in fact, the uncertainty is very important and the income distribution worsening is also very important. Because as we have seen, who are the ones who have lost jobs? In fact, there's an article which came out in EPW, Economic and Political Weekly recently, which says, uh, you know, there was uh, in the last census shows something like five, 55, uh, uh, you know, five crores uh, migrants among laborers. And then uh, interstate migration, you can calculate in very many ways. But there's a big chunk of this just lost their jobs. And how much the uh, you know owners of capital have lost their wherewithals is debatable. No doubt the small and medium industry were the most severely hit. And obviously, this section uh, is, is also suffering from this COVID, post-COVID scenario. But the major loss is with these uh, workers. I am not saying only the migrant workers. Five crores may be migrant workers. Out of that, maybe uh, two, three crores have come back to their homeland or their home state. But those who are working in the home state, they are not migrants. They are working in that state. So in West Bengal, there are so many people who are working in West Bengal. They haven't gone out. Not that they have gone to Surat or they have gone to Telangana, they have gone to Maharashtra, they have gone to Kerala, but they are well within West Bengal. They have also suffered. The problem is, there is no clear-cut estimate about this. The how much they have suffered, and this will come up, I guess, so when the surveys are done, we'll have a better idea that how much they have lost in terms of income. And uh, the impact of this on income distribution, that will come maybe four years later. I'm not sure. I mean, they lag so much, this income distributional issues. So they might come when, I don't know. But just think about that. Now in this whole scenario, we are thinking about 
that uh, this is somewhat this is this is uh, continuing from last financial year 2019-20 when the growth rate was supposed to be 7% around that it's just 4% the the growth rate of real gdp so the point is the national kit has not uh, increased the way it was thought about so naturally everybody has suffered and there's unequal suffering so already the distribution was moving against some of this uh, you know, groups of people in the economy. Already there was uncertainty because casual labor, casualization had increased. Uh, some of these industries were already saying that this unintended accumulation of inventory, say automobile sector or even textile sector, uh, some of this uh, electronics good industry, they were already saying that, look, we do not have enough demand we have unintended accumulation of inventories and along with that as you can understand that services as such is not completely consumed by the household sector much of this service demand is generated from manufacturing and industrial sector so naturally this uh, associated services also suffered so this uncertainty people were not sure whether you know daily workers for example and if we think about that, uh, so last PLFS, you know, the uh, the labor survey which is done, uh, the most recent survey which is done, is almost like they claim about 71% is informal sector workers. Unofficial estimates put it anything like 80, 85%. But in a large chunk, they do not have any papers. Uh, and they, they are already in an uncertain world. Even those who are salaried and wage earners, formal sector, for example, there's increasing tendency of you know daily labor, casualization. So uncertainty was also there because industries uh, did not have enough demand. So naturally, there is some kind of a layoff going on. Think about this scenario. Uncertainty already was there. Some kind of adverse income distribution, I'm quite sure were happening. Now think about COVID. Both of these tendencies got just an accelerated movement. Now think about that. A simple Keynesian story. And that's worldwide, everywhere. This is being followed. Uh, you know, push in money. United States, say 12% of their GDP. European Union, something like close to say 8-9%, depending on the country, European Union. Together, if you take a longer term view, something like 10% or more of their combined GDP. UK, for example, ensured uh, medium and small industries a salary for, uh, I guess, something like uh, six months or so that they will pay the salaries, UK government. It's all kind of pushing, uh, you know, money into the economy, either direct transfer or whatever way, pump priming, if you call it, this old phrase, Keynesians type story. So you just push in money keep the wheels moving, although the factories are not moving, but people should get the money and let the demand be there. Because that's the reason why the economy has fallen into some kind of a recessionary trap and then might move into a longer term depressionary situation. Now, just think about that. Suppose you push in 100 rupees. And if there is complete certainty and there is no worsening of income distribution, the multiplier will work in a certain way. So 100 rupees, and suppose people will spend out of that, and maybe if their marginal propensity is quite high, because most of this apparently will go to, you know, the, the, the farmers or the women or the old age people, you know, Indian government, you see the package. And the state government, what they have done. In real terms, maybe uh, putting in, some kind of uh, um, you know food and other uh, health free ration or whatever and you take combined of this and then if the marginal propensity is high people will spend and suppose if for uh, you know the poorer people who are getting this benefit mostly they have high mpc if they were 0.9 mpc 100 rupees 90 rupees comes out of them their pocket moves in rounds etc but now 
suppose this is a very high level of uncertainty and the income distribution is worsening so in a sense this uh, if you, if you look at the overall uh, story if you push in 100 rupees just a calculation of mpc is 0.9 so they will spend 90 rupees doesn't make any sense perhaps they will keep a large portion of what they get today for uncertain tomorrow how much we don't know and that's exactly the calculation needs to be done and then if the distribution of income changes you can just plug it into your overall multiplier and see what the multiplier is and i can tell you simple calculations the multiplier will be much less so the the total impact of the fiscal stimulus will be much less given this indian government's direct fiscal stimulus is close to something like one percent of gdp all of us know that it's a well-known thing now and the rest is some kind of a i would say mostly monetary policy uh, you know flushing the banking system with liquidity uh, guaranteeing medium small industries and farmers uh, by the government the guaranteed is government that take loans we are guaranteed so the banks uh, will be assured this uh, segment of those uh, entrepreneurs and farmers will be assured etc etc so mostly monetary policy scenario but the direct stimulus is one person now if you calculate your stimulus will lead to a shift in your aggregate demand disregarding increase in uncertainty and disregarding a change in income distribution you will think you will have a great effect of that because the marginal propensity of these people is high they will come to the market demand and the economy will start moving but if you plug it in maybe uh, what you what, what matters what happens is your uh, suggested or your perceived change in demand is half or maybe one third so what you need what you thought that the stimulus uh, will do you have to put in maybe three times or four times more stimulus money direct stimulus money in order for the desired effect to come in in the short run so this is my first point and i think uh, we talk about comparison of you know Indian uh, India has put in one percent, while USA ten percent, European Union ten uh, percent. We are doing one percent. That kind of a mechanical comparison doesn't make much sense to me. But what makes sense to me is a clear-cut economic logic. That in, uh, the, the calculation which was done by the government maybe uh, is uh, somewhat much much underestimated. So the amount of stimulus should have been a lot more i can't see you the figure four times five times i can't see you the exact figure because i haven't done the calculation with empirical data it's just a theoretical conjecture which i'm saying once the aggregate demand is hit and remember already the supply side was having a strain was uh, quite a strain economic strain because in 2019 20 uh, some of these very highly linked industries, including, you know, the automobile is certainly linked industry, and then uh, some of these uh, electronics industry, engineering industries were uh, just getting this kind of economic strain. So aggregate supply was already having this kind of a situation that if I have an unintended accumulation of inventory, I should cut my output. And this, this also includes the construction sector. And then the services, as I said, much of this service, much, I don't know the majority, but a, a, a huge portion of this service, the whole demand is generated in the manufacturing sector. So when the manufacturing and construction, these activities are hard hit, then, uh, and the, this unintended accumulation of inventories in all these sectors, the aggregate supply is already having a problem and then you have two things which happened one is this migrant labor have uh, you know they have went back they have gone back to their own states i'm not sure whether they will come back 
to the place where they were stationed as input and then you have this broken supply chain in electronics in pharmaceuticals in chemicals industries some of this industries which are backbone of the indian economy right now if you talk about the non agricultural sector and the supply chain was severely hit so two important problems which arose in case of the aggregate supply one is this uh, migrant labor going back to the to the home states as uh, in another article dipankar dasgupta and minakshi rajib called it the transaction cost will rise when you start uh, or try to start increasing your output once more and as well as if the supply chain is disturbed you have a problem the input cost may go up just because you are not getting it in time time is obviously a cost so altogether the cost will go up and so aggregate supply has a problem too so aggregate demand if we consider it to be the major problem because after all the engine in the economy is personal uh, consumption expenditure of households 60% of our gdp if that suffers from uncertainty and worsening income distribution is a big problem so the demand side problem and naturally comes to our mind is a very dominating thing and then the supply side problem as i just mentioned is also important take them together we have a contraction and then uh, in the longer run these are all short term adjustments in the longer run we have to sustain the growth obviously we have a negative uh, growth scenario in these quarters and finally end of the day in 2021 31st march what will happen whether it will decrease by 3% or 4% is a different story so obviously given this uh, you know long run i would just touch upon this because this depends on uh, how much savings we are generating how much capital formation these issues i'll just touch upon that i'll not go too much deep into it so what's the way out basically the short run way out we already talked about and west bengal is no exception now i just mention one thing in this context obviously uh, the indian government is going towards something like 3% extra deficit they were supposed to have a 3.5% budgeted fiscal deficit that will go up to say 6% or 6.5% and they have already going towards that but then in order to restrict the overall deficit and the debt gdp ratio they have constrained the states if states want to borrow 2% extra first point 5% unconditional the rest 1.5% depends on number of conditions that they have to uh, increase their ease of doing business they have to uh, revise or they have to introduce innovative ways the panchayats earn their revenue uh, they have to make uh, changes in electric uh, tariffs in uh, you know electricity etc etc i find this in a federal setup is not really very uh, justifiable that the central government we understand they have a bigger duty no doubt but they can go for this uh, unconstrained uh, increase in budget deficit leaving the frbm act somewhat you know aside and which i think is a very natural and logical step but then uh, states putting so much constraint on the states after all the states are going to implement some of the nitty gritties to the uh, you know to the to the person who is lowest down in the in the society it's a state's responsibility basically if you constrain them so much it's not a very welcome move and i think west bengal also will suffer from this to a large extent now given this uh, uh, i think i i should take another another 5 minutes uh, chandan is that okay i don't know i'm just speaking yes. i think 5 minutes is fine yes sir very much for waiting you can continue oh, okay okay fine so uh, uh, what's the way out i mean in the longer term scenario because you see what has happened this 40000 crores extra given to the 100 days work has saved the migrant labor to a large extent 
but as you can understand this is a waste of you know uh, skill after all the migrant labor had certain skill and they are forced to go for this 100 days work just to sustain themselves and this goes against the trend which we had after all, 45% say in West Bengal, 45% people live in rural areas. But the non-farm employment or income which they earn from non-farm activities is something like 80%. Either it is some kind of uh, retail trade they are doing or repair services, maintenance services, some construction, some manufacturing activities these have not picked up agriculture uh, was largely uh, uh, you know left to its uh, own momentum after lockdown was imposed very soon within 15 days i would say but after all agriculture doesn't generate the income even in rural areas so if the non-farm activities do not pick up where would we go and uh, so so given this kind of a situation which we have the uh, we have to think about this and also we must note that if consumption expenditure personal consumption expenditure driving force in the economy that that really drives the economy right now because it's 60 percent of total expenditure the even as it, you know common household as very standard household which we say spend about 40 percent of their income on the average on food 60 percent is on other non-food items including education health industrial or manufactured goods services etc so just thinking about that we should rejuvenate agriculture will not do neither it will increase the uh, consumption expenditure which will give a push towards the demand nor it will generate a stable income earning scenario for this you know large amount of call it unorganized informal workers daily labor casual labor who are the majority who are the backbone who are the high marginal propensity to consume on whom we have so much faith because remember they might not be saving a lot but if the distribution goes more towards those who have, uh, you know, more wealth in the economy, you never know where the savings will go. They may go to gold accumulation. They might go outside the country. They will uh, go to unauthorized construction activities, maybe, which, uh, you know, the government loses in that sense. There's a lot of problems in that. So how to sustain uh, your uh, employment for example in the longer run which will also push the growth i will put in this context the uh, the real dramatis personae here i mean the the, the 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 kind of sector which holds the key is manufacturing plus if i take the whole industrial sector then construction now, why I say manufacturing? Because uh, in manufacturing, we have this medium and small industries who provided about in the last uh, in NSS survey, which we found, uh, they provided something like 11 crores of jobs, produce 40% of GDP, and that's important. They created jobs. And if I take an input output analysis where I take the direct jobs which they create and the indirect one, and the indirect one and which a lot of input output tables and uh, you know people who work on this just simply miss is all the services they create transport service if the manufacturing doesn't pick up the transport service will not and that's the one of the biggest employment generators in in the service sector is not it it's transport then travel then obviously you have all our logistics, the maintenance and repair, that's another very big service. Very big, much bigger than IT. We talk so much about IT. But obviously, IT will also be affected. If manufacturing gets a stimulus, if they start running, if they start running, then along with that, a lot of service will start running. 
and you create a path where uh, income earning, stable income earning would be created. But the problem lies there. The government has a complete faith that if you flush the economy with money, these people will come and take money. In an uncertain world, even in 2019-20, the credit uh, which was given to this corporate sector, especially medium and small industries, this simply was halved. If that grew in the earlier year by 16%, that grew at, at a rate of 6 to 7% last year. So people are just not coming. They are not picking up this loan. Uncertain future. If the government stands guarantee for six months, what will happen after that? And if you take the uh, adverse selection, those will come forward are all fishy investors. India is full of them. So what will happen? So, so much faith on the monetary policy and credit is unfortunate given the Indian scenario. And if we have to put faith in the medium and small, because employment is a big issue here. Daily labor and others, they have to have a sustainable income generation activity. They will not come forward all of a sudden and take loans with two hands. I'm not leaving the banks aside. They might have done certainty too. One way, and I will stop here, I will touch upon that. One way the medium and small industry, and unfortunately, West Bengal, uh, you know, hosts second largest number of small and uh, medium industry, MSME sector, as we say. Uh, uh, in fact, and they are the, I would say also, one of the largest creators of employment, West Bengal, all over India in the MSME sector. But in terms of productivity, they are last but one, I guess. One of the worst in terms of productivity. So in the competitive world, and if you look at the central government, what they are doing, and that's what's going around, that all the big, uh, you know, uh, the big country, the, the, the countries in the West who really have this big corporate headquarters of big companies and in this fragmented outsourcing world, these big companies have complete faith in China. They control something like 22 to 23 percent of the whole industrial supply chain and they got a shock and they wanted to diversify this and they are doing it. Although India got 5 percent of this diversification as far as I've seen the last data, it's almost like 90% uh, has gone to Southeast Asian countries when the diversification has started. But suppose in future, if the Indian government keeps to its promise, what they have suggested last budget and what they are suggesting in Atmanirvan and all these things which they are suggesting now, if that is true, if that we take faithfully, MSME has a golden future. Because that's the sector which provides the intermediate inputs and parts and components to the rest of the world. It's not the big industries which produce the parts components. It's the small which produce. Look at the Southeast Asia, you're all small. And if India, the efficiency factor is taken care of, of the MSME, that will become, that means if we can integrate ourselves most to this global value chain, taking this opportunity, and also, I would say not only global, maybe the Indian value chains as well. That's a sustainable strategy. Otherwise, the number of births and deaths in MSME sector is very close. Startups die, startups grow up. And there is an unstable you know, equilibrium to a certain extent that they do not move. They are somewhat static, sterile, because there are so many deaths in the startup. But this, this integration in the global value chain, taking advantage of the current world scenario, will give us some hope to the MSME in manufacturing. That will give Philip to the manufacturing sector, that which I think is the is, is the main main sector with, on, on which we should put our stress. And that will also to a certain extent create, I won't say permanent jobs but stable employment. Let me stop here and I can take up questions later on if needed. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your illuminating uh, speech. Uh, may I now call Dr. Bibhar Shahar, 
Vibhasta to present over there. Vibhasta. Just after a wonderful lecture of Professor Yersi, my own teacher, uh, yeah. we are about to listen to Dr. Bibhas Shaha's uh, lecture. Uh, Dr. Bibhas Shaha, he is Associate Professor of Durham University Business School, University of Durham, United Kingdom. And today he will speak on post pandemic health challenges of India. Right. Thank you, Chandan. I so, uh, hope you can hear me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, please start. Okay. You, well, can, thank you, you. Can, you can talk for uh, about around uh, 30 minutes. And after your uh, speech, we will have an interaction session of half an hour. And then, okay. we, will, uh, then we will end our today session. Okay. Okay. So now, yeah. please thank start. you, Chandan. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the talk. And uh, you have uh, already heard from Sancheri and Ajita Buddha about the economic uh, uh, situations and particularly the policy dilemmas this pandemic has uh, uh, created uh, for us. So, this is, uh, of course, a um, a, a, a bit of a problem, problem. and uh, uh, I'm going to I'm look going at, to look at uh, uh, is, is that an is eco, that an eco on the on the problem, problem Chandra? Yeah, it's eco is coming up. Okay. Okay. Uh, Everybody has to switch off their microphone, otherwise the eco will come. All right, uh, hold on. I'm trying to get to, uh, I'm trying to share my screen with this slide and it's just the technical part is, is uh, all right. I think now I will be able to do, I was not getting, all right. Okay, I'm going to uh, restart. So thank you everybody for joining this session. And, uh, I'm going to mostly talk about the health challenges at present and in future. Right. Um, you know, in our classroom, we talk about the complementarity between healthcare and good economy. You know, if one is good, the other one will also be good. And there is a synergy between the two that needs to be exploited as well. However, pandemic has kind of turned everything upside down. Uh, now we are in a situation where you have to shut the economy down to save lives. So normally save lives to save economy, now shut economy to save lives or sacrifice the economy. We know that's the biggest challenge. Now, if we look at uh, the history, I know I've been hearing in not just in India, but uh, you know, all over the world, politicians are saying that this is an unprecedented uh, pandemic, never happened, which is a lie. It hasn't happened in their lifetime, sure, but it has happened to, to mankind many, many times before. And when politicians use that argument, they are basically try to give an excuse. Look, you know, this is too much of a problem. We have never seen this, you know. So if we fail, don't blame us. Let's uh, look at just about a hundred, well, uh, uh, COVID-19. India, as you know, <clears throat> I mean, the data I have here is few days old. Uh, today I saw, um, in the last 24 hours, India's daily caseload has risen to 75,000. I think it just touched what uh, US did um, uh, a few weeks ago or last month. And India's uh, death toll, India has now um, uh, exceeded Mexico and, and number three in terms of not just uh, death toll, but 
uh, as well as the total caseload. If we go back 100 years, actually, in the Spanish flu, whole world was in a, a pretty much the same, same situation. And how many people died in India? Well, uh, 13 million. Uh, I'm taking an average figure here. The estimate is, is, is within a range. And India had the largest number of deaths in the world. And mind that Spanish flu is something which we do not hear that much in India, at least not in our storybook. We have not read much about Spanish flu. So I was a bit surprised. Why is that? Well, part of the reason is the Spanish flu did, did not devastate Bengal as much as it did to the western part of the country and the northern part. Uh, still, 1.3 crores of people uh, died. Uh, it's no joke. And let's put China in perspective. China had a death toll of around 70 lakhs or so, so about 7 million. So China and India, the two had the largest number of dead. And if you uh, like to read things of historical nature, you know, Spanish flu, did not originate uh, from Spain. The name is quite accidental. Uh, historians believe it started from US and then traveled to the rest of the world through their soldiers via First World War uh, trenches in Europe. Okay, so that's the history of Spanish flu. Uh, cholera, that's roughly about 200 years now. Uh, cholera uh, pandemic originated from Bengal and India um, had 100,000 sub deaths, but uh, it, it, of course, over the years, it spread to the rest of the world and uh, many, many more people died. Now, a picture. Uh, this is 1918. Um, a hospital in Kansas, USA, where the, the virus believed to have uh, originated, uh, have had originated. And you can see the picture is pretty much the uh, same as we see today. I think in Mumbai, um, there was a hospital built up, something like this. And a few countries, so China, did that to a similar kind of facility and mask <laughs> you see 1918 mask was a, a almost must for everybody uh, this picture is from us but the all these things that we are talking about hand washing not spitting in public and wearing face mask uh, quarantine all of these uh, was uh, used in large measure in 1918 pandemic um, since 47, of course, India has uh, a few episodes, uh, but more localized. Dengue or plague, 1994, uh, Surat plague, we know. Uh, then dengue, swine flu, and of course, 74 smallpox. So we did have quite a few episodes of epidemics. And as I see that over the last 200 years, of course, you can say before 47, this was uh, a colonial, uh, under colonial rule. So it should not be compared with today's. But the general, uh, uh, one cannot help but feel uh, that actually there is very little learning on the part of the government. And that something is, is very disheartening. I have a quote here, a health officer of Calcutta in 1918, and of course this was probably an Englishman. <clears throat> so it says the excessive mortality in the Kedipur areas appears to be due mainly to the large coolie population, ignorant and poverty stricken, living under most insanitary conditions in damp, dark, dirty hearts. They are a difficult class to deal with. So that was the public uh, official's view 
that these people are dying because they are bloody ignorant. They, they, they do not understand science, they do not follow the rules, and they live in terrible conditions, which uh, is the cause of their, and, and nothing we can do about it. Well, that's pretty much the view, still the government officials and many politicians as well. Uh, that's, uh, I, I believe it's, it hasn't changed much. If, had, if it did, we would not be uh, seeing, uh, would not have seen the lockdown that India uh, imposed in a four hours notice and almost eight crores of migrant workers were left abandoned and stranded with uh, no place to stay and uh, nothing to eat and no income at all. And we know now hundreds of uh, kilometers people walked, people tried to hitchhike and tried to reach home, but government apparently, apparently, oh, did not anticipate this. How the hell you not anticipate this? I somehow don't understand it. But the, 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 you do not anticipate this problem when basically you think this is a problem of the poor people. Let them figure out how to live. We just do not need to worry about it. And mind that India's middle class and of course the rich, they all supported the government. I do not know why, what was their calculation, but they were happy that not many people would be wandering around in streets carrying the virus, so they remain protected in their secure home environment. Of course, we know India's uh, this maverick policy uh, was disastrous, it was short sighted, it was politically motivated, not led by science. At that point, India did not need to go into a complete and total uh, lockdown. But that's what they did. People supported it. And now they face the consequence of over 61,000 deaths as of today, and probably many thousands more. And practically, if, we, if I see things from outside, as I'm seeing from here, government basically have give, given up. They have no plan what to do. And people also do not expect the government uh, to do much. So that's where we have. Now, you know that health is not something we can be very proud of. India's health situation has all along been uh, quite poor. Although things have been improving, in fact, on the area of infant mortality, where we, we had a very, uh, very poor record, things have improved. You can see between 1960 and 2018, um, there is a dramatic drop, and much of the drop has happened uh, between uh, 2000 and 2018. Only 29 and roughly 30 uh, infants die uh, per 1,000 live births. But still, in South Asia, where India claims to be the biggest superpower of this region and aspiring to be a superpower in the world one day, uh, well, not doing so well, we can see by these figures, just doing better than Pakistan, that's all really. All other countries in South Asia are ahead of us. On the immunization side, there has been significant progress on the uh, triple antigen or what is called uh, uh, DPT. 91% um, uh, 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 of surviving children now receive uh, three booster doses of DPT, but uh, there are other uh, immunization which is we are not doing well and, and progress has been slow. But here is the biggest problem. There are certain things I, I see uh, uh, in India, uh, somehow certain problems don't appear to go away. I do not know. Like in education, 
we know the school enrollment has uh, gone up uh, significantly over the years and, and particularly at primary school the enrollment rate uh, about 100 percent however when we come to older children the dropout problem seems to be persistent likewise on the health sector we see that women's health is a huge huge issue now low bmi uh, body mass index or underweight uh, it, this problem in india in 2015 2005 six e even if we go back to 98 99 all we see the percentage of women uh, um, categorized or identified as low bmi is roughly one third or little over one third of the population uh, of, of women that problem does not appear to go away at all uh, and there are many uh, authors who have pointed out the problem is that the 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 girl child or many infants uh, uh, are born with low weight to begin with because the mothers are are not given due uh, prenatal care also uh, particularly among low income families and certain uh, sort of cultural uh, reasons also there women are not uh, so you know given due care health care so humans women suffer from mm, neglect on the health side and that leads to do low bmi that then affects ch child health and and there's a long term consequences so in our healthcare we see two types of failures one is government has failures well government hospitals cannot be trusted or people don't trust them or you cannot access them easily market failure on the other hand if you have uh, money you can go to a private doctor and you can get any treatment you want but then there are situations when a private market fails a you may get wrong treatment you may be overcharged or you may simply not have money to go to a doctor i understand in this uh, current pandemic situation many uh, nursing homes and private hospitals are charging huge amount of money uh, for covid from covid patients and even even if you have health insurance they are not apparently honoring the insurance uh, because the charges may not be uh, quite justifiable so uh, what we see is that <clears throat> india has a huge india has been relying on a private healthcare market in the kind of mixed private and public but over the years what, uh, what has happened is the poor people who rely on public health care but then that becomes very congested becomes poor quality and people who can afford rely on private markets now if we look at four countries uh, i've taken for example us brazil india and uk all of these have um, very high mortality rate or COVID, not mortality rate, but number of fatality, very high. Well, let's look at their system. US, we know, mostly private via health insurance. Uh, Brazil, mostly public. UK, <clears throat> almost entirely public system. And India, a mix of public uh, and private, as we all know. But the, so the point I'm trying to make is the public or the pri private, the, the mode of delivery of healthcare is not the fundamental issue, particularly in a crisis of, of pandemic or, or epidemic. That it, it is mode of delivery plus you need to have timely action and you need to have due preparation. And this is where 
the, the, the government, public health administration or, or public health bodies or politicians or political leaderships have to make the right call. They have to make that decision. Unfortunately, in India, uh, government had time. Government went into lockdown, but did not do due preparation for the coming uh, crisis. Somehow, uh, they they transformed this problem into from a from a medical problem into a political problem. And therefore, uh, some people started calling it a, a, a Muslim virus. Some people started calling Chinese virus and then started blaming one group over the other. But the reality is the entire month of March and April, nothing much really happened in India. The, the virus did not spread at all uh, like uh, what we are seeing now. So it waited. The virus was waiting. Uh, for months uh, for the community transmission to go on. And politicians were telling you that, okay, see, we did this, we did that, everything under control. We now know that was just talk. Okay. So there are a, a number of issues I, I, that comes in terms of tackling this uh, particular pandemic. We know regardless of the mode of delivery on the ground, you need to have all kinds of things. PP, you know, it's a much talked about, everybody knows. In, and ventilators for uh, the very serious patients. But also what you need is to scale up very quickly. The, the response time for this kind of pandemic is very little. So you have to scale up your testing and tracing and, and, and you have to scale up within a few uh, uh, weeks. Now, this is where you need to have a, a rapid response um, and government needs the trust of the people. What has happened in, in India, as we see in West Bengal, and in center as well, and probably many other states, what we see on the streets are <coughs> um, police. Police have taken over the state, every street, market everywhere, you know, beating up people, not following the rules, not wearing masks. This is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. What you need is communities coming together. You need volunteers in every neighborhood who are looking after the people who have fallen ill. I give you an example. Here in UK, when this lockdown started, uh, government made a call for uh, 75,000 volunteers uh, who could come and help the elderly to get their medicine, to get their shopping, this and that, and generally you go around the neighborhood and see everyone is fine or not. The response from people was not 75,000, but 250,000 people came forward to be volunteers. Opposite my house, a couple um, came and, and sent, uh, put a note through our door saying, if you need any help, don't hesitate to call them. I've never seen a policeman in our neighborhood here. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. You need to have people's trust. You need to bring people together, but not policemen and, and, and punitive uh, sort of regime that Indian um, governments, unfortunately, both at the center and state have engaged in. So this is, uh, of course, where we are, we are. Uh, we may uh, all have our own preferences, choices, what we want, what we don't want. But going forward, India, I, if any lesson we have to learn is that we need to revamp our health system. We should not depend so much on the private sector. It's just a 
completely out of control uh, a system now we have. States, also there is a center state issue. Now health uh, being a state matter, state does not have much money. State have very little power of taxation now. And therefore you need to have proper financial entil ent entitlement going forward. The center must make appropriate transfer to, to the states. And I must say, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of these big fancy hospitals which becomes a showpiece. And eventually politicians will say, look, I have done this, vote me for another four, uh, five years. We need healthcare in every neighborhood by a, a, a health center where you can go and, and get, if you run a fever, a doctor or a qualified nurse, <clears throat> We'll, we'll prescribe you uh, certain basic, you know, uh, medicines and things like that. Hospitals should be run by healthcare professionals and managers, not civil servants. Civil servants are there to collect revenue, to enforce law and order. That's what they know best. They cannot run hospitals. And, and by the way, I do not know we have a right to healthcare act or not. Uh, but if, if, if we don't, it's high time we do. Uh, unfortunately, I've not seen uh, that is much discussed now at this time. I, I will probably, I'm mindful of the time and I do not have much time to go through the vaccine issue, but briefly I will tell you this. Uh, where are we now in terms of vaccine, right? Well, this slide that I have is slightly old. Uh, as of now, there are 200 vaccines being tried uh, in the process of development. And you know that Russia has kind of gone ahead and declared that they got it. Uh, many countries don't trust that, but nevertheless, that's what Russia has claimed. China some time ago said they are at the final stage and they are uh, um, sort of inocul inoculating or they're injecting it to their soldiers. Uh, UK uh, is has a, also has a major effort going on, so does US. But what we are hearing from scientists and experts that still to make it available to the people, uh, we are still, uh, at least four or five months away. And to make it to, uh, <coughs> um, to general public, still longer time because it's going to cost quite a bit of money. On this issue, I should point out, there was a global conference on May 4 uh, about this vaccine cooperation. All the countries should be coming together to develop the con vaccine learning from each other. But no, that is not happening. US, Russia, and India did not join this conference uh, for no mysterious reasons. India did not want to join. I don't know. Probably India wants to go with US. US has its own agenda. And as we know, under Trump administration, under Trump, they, that thinking is a bit different. So uh, <clears throat> what we see now, uh, instead of global cooperation, what we are seeing is called so-called vaccine nationalism. Mr. Modi claimed that uh, India will have a vaccine by 15th August. It hasn't happened, uh, but probably it will come near the end of the year. As you know, there is already a, a sort of a mechanism or, a, or a, a platform for vaccine development under WHO. That's a non-profit one, but uh, uh, that is being bypassed now. And there are all kinds of other uh, uh, facilities exist, but there is a private uh, business motive working here as well from in a large number of multinationals. And a uh, lot of people die because these vaccines will not be made available cheaply. So my, my fear is that 
for average Indian to get hold of the vaccine at a reasonable price. We have to wait for a while. I read some time ago uh, is that uh, the vaccine is going to cost two doses at least you need to have and that's that will give you immunity for a year. Uh, I think China has uh, uh, with uh, United Arab Emirates are uh, in the final stage of this uh, development. Um, is the cost of such two doses will come to 10,000 rupees in Indian terms. So that's uh, quite a lot of money. I do not know uh, whether the Indian government will uh, spend that money, but that's an open question. So I'll stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bivasta. Thank you for our wonderful lecture. Thank you. Uh, so can we now, uh, I guess, Ajita Buda, Professor Ajita Buda Chaudhary is also out of, out of Google Meet right now. We have to contact with him through phone. I'm very much in. Uh, I'm there. Oh, oh, oh sir, sir, you are here. Okay, 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 sir. So can we just, uh, can we just start our interactive session right now? Because we have shortages of time, uh, just 15 minutes. Can we start it? Sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, we just have two questions right now with us and the audience uh, amongst us, they can, they can even, they can ask by themselves. Uh, if they if they just write their name in the chat box that they have any question, I can unmute. I can ask them to unmute. Uh, so just the first question which we have, I'm just asking. Bangla te kora hoyche prashno ta. Bola hoyche je ei virus se share market kiba be revived hobe. Shonar dhamme ro kore te COVID-19 ne ki impact korte. Uh, situation ke, uh, combat the government. This is the first question. Zeta chat box says, Rampur Hart take a Priya Shortcut. Our second question Korachin Liakat Ali, Alia University Research Scholar. Uni uh, Wolchen, do you think the steps of our central and state government uh, to revive the economy is sufficient? A Duto question Abra Akun Pechi. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, 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 I Ojita Buddha Judi center stated with a ball and Talami virus to both the party stock market take to bull Lamato. A duty of Hakor in a Hamaboro, Bivas. Ah, market, do they get a shop Ah, expertise name stock market some for cake into stock market at the moment I'm the Dekchi, J. Global shop they said he's a way. I mean, sensex or follow Corina. Jeta Hoche Akakta Asar Kobor Jagli Songa Songa Sensex by Sobdesi stock market opore Uche Jamon Posu America Posu Kita Ragedin a stock market base hot at Chora Huegalo among Donald Trump's certain vision credit claim Kolo because he announced the plasma therapy. এখন সে এক্সিকিউটিভ অর্ডার দিচ্ছে প্লাজমা থেরাপি করা যাবে যাতে কোভিড پیشنট ভালো হয় নাও প্লাজমা থেরাপি নিয়ে একটা কতটা এফেক্টিভ এটা নিয়ে ডাক্তারদের এবং সায়েন্টিস্টদের একটা দীর্ঘদিনের প্রশ্ন আছে সো ইট ইজ আনপ্রুভেন দ্যাট ওয়ে হাউ এফেক্টিভ ইন্ডিয়া তো প্লাজমা থেরাপি করছে কিন্তু ট্রাম্প এটাকে একটা একটা পার্টিকুলার ডে যেদিন রিপাবলিকান কনভেনশনের প্রথম দিন সেই দিন ঠিক তার আগে টাইম করলো 
so that the stock market shot up abar ajke khobor dekhchi financial times e je fed chairman uh, past chairman actually bodhay um, ekta bokkita dite jacche je ekta ektu negative shonabe so already stock market is is down so stock market er ei je roller coaster byapar ta cholche ebong eta cholte thakbe একটা ভ্যাকসিনের খবর এলি একটা বাড়বে আবার তারপর কমবে ইন্ডিয়ার ক্ষেত্রে একটা অ্যাডিশনাল ইস্যু হচ্ছে যে ইন্ডিয়ার হচ্ছে যে ইন্ডিয়ার স্টক মার্কেট খুব সেন্সিটিভ হচ্ছে গ্লোবাল কন্ডিশন ইম্প্রুভ করছে কি করছে না তার উপরে কারণ খুব এক্সপোর্টের ওপর আমাদের ইনকামটা এখন খুব ডিপেন্ডেন্ট হচ্ছে আর এক্সপোর্ট সিনারি ইজ নট গোয়িং টু ইম্প্রুভ ভেরি সুন so that's one of the thing for india so overall uh, uh, stock market barbe kombe kintu ami jani na koto ta dhore rakhte parbe uh, stable thakbe kina ar uh, onno jeta hocche je gold price to ei shomoy barbei loke ekta safe asset e switch korte chay so the problem will continue and uh, ajita boda age ei supply side and demand side dutu problem kibhabe joriye geche ekshonge bolchen তো দ্যাট ইজ অ্যানাদার রিজন যে ফান্ডামেন্টাল গুলো রিয়েল সেক্টরে অনেক রকম প্রবলেম আছে এবং আমি একটা জিনিস বলবো যে রিস্কটা কথা আলোচনা করা হচ্ছে না সেটা হচ্ছে যে এই প্যান্ডেমিক থেকে ফাইন্যান্সিয়াল সেক্টরের একটা মেল ডাউন হওয়ার খুব রিস্ক আছে সো দিস ইজ টু থাউজেন্ড নাইন এ উইনো ফাইন্যান্সিয়াল সেক্টর হ্যাড এ ক্রাইসিস দ্যাট সেইটা রিয়েল সেক্টরে পড়ে কিছুদিন বাদে ছড়িয়ে যেতে একটা গ্লোবাল রিসেশনে যায় এখানে উল্টোটা হচ্ছে এখন পর্যন্ত ফাইন্যান্সিয়াল সেক্টরে ক্রাইসিস শুরু হয়নি তার কারণ সব দেশই গভর্নমেন্ট প্রচুর স্টিমুলাস প্যাকেজ দিয়েছে বা বেল আউট করছে কিন্তু ইন্ডিয়া অলরেডি একটা হিউজ নন পারফর্মিং অ্যাসেটের ওপর বসে রয়েছে ইন্ডিয়ান ব্যাংকগুলো আমার ভয় হচ্ছে এইটার অবস্থা আরও খারাপ হবে এবং এইটা খারাপ হলে একটা ব্যাংকিং ক্রাইসিস এর সম্ভাবনা কিন্তু রয়েছে বাট এখন পুরো জিনিসটাই নির্ভর করছে কতদিন প্যান্ডেমিক চলবে সো দি ইট ইজ সামথিং টু বি ওয়ারি দেবা অজিত বাবা আচ্ছা আমি মানে আই জাস্ট ওয়ান্ট টু অ্যাড আ লিটল বিট যেটা বিভাস বললো সেটা হচ্ছে যে আমাদের ইন্ডিয়ার যদি সেন্সেক্স দেখি সেন্সেক্স মানে কি ব্লু চিপস মানে সবচেয়ে ভালো বড় কোম্পানি গুলো দিয়ে সেন্সেক্স ড্রিভেন হয় তাতে ইফ উই লুক অ্যাট দ্য ডেটা এন্ড আই ডিড সাম ওয়ার্ক আর্লিয়ার দ্যাট দেয়ার আর টু টাইপস অফ এন্টিটিস হুইচ ইনফ্লুয়েন্স দি সেন্সেক্স ওয়ান ইজ দি ফরেন ইনস্টিটিউশনাল ইনভেস্টার্স বিকজ দি সো কলড পোর্টফোলিও ইনভেস্টার্স দি অ্যামাউন্ট দে পুশ ইট ইন টু দ্য ইকোনমি that drives the share market among it's a lead and lag that whether the indian entities lead or the foreign entities lead unfortunately jeta amader despite the 80% of our primary market is held not more than that i would say 85% is held by indian institutional investors and individuals we are not the leaders we are followers to shei khetre that mane it's not export salon it's the institutional investors who control and who drives the exchange rate as well as the share prices they are kind of a interlinked so since the uh, institutional investment is falling uh, this, this this creates a problem for our share market but in any case our share market is somewhat uh, uh, behave somewhat funnily because it's driven by some of the blue chip companies and uh, uh, those come like in usa when the share market was going down all the uh, so called uh, e commerce or it companies they flourish like anything amazon google you name it they flourish like anything so that uh, there are uh, asymmetric uh, you know uh, movements which is happening in share market sheita ekto khyal rakha dorkar acha it coming to the uh, whether it's adequate the center state response as i said adequate or non adequate a simple comparison with what usa or uk or eu is done, is doing it makes no sense it has to be in terms of our own need and as i said since 
uh, the whole thing was done with a very traditional mode of, uh, I say, uh, frame of mind. That as if the uncertainty is not there, as if the distribution is not moving against the those who have high marginal propensities. Jara bishi khotcha kore. In thoro na assumption niye kholle naturally we are underestimating a whole lot about uh, uh, the actual effect data. Sorry, we are overestimating. We are thinking that there will be too much effect, but actually the effect will be much less. How much more we should have done? Eita we bolte bache. But anything between three to four times possible. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, we have Partho, Professor Partho Pratimpal with us, who is also uh, tomorrow's speaker. He has some specific questions. And be visible and ask him one question. Yeah, good afternoon, good afternoon, Ajit Yes. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask that uh, there is a hypothesis that the excess liquidity that is there in the market due to infusion of money by both central banks of the, all the central banks of the world that is leading to the asset price inflation everywhere, including gold and equity. And secondly, there is also this new story of the so called Robin Hood investors that people are not doing any work elsewhere. So they are trying to put their money in the stock markets. So a massive wave of retail investors, in fact, in the last few months, more than 1 million DMAT account has been created in India. So these guys are also fueling a kind of a speculative rally in the stock market. So I wanted to know your views on this. Do you think these are credible explanations? Well, very difficult question, Patho. I think you will you will tackle it tomorrow when you speak. It's more, more you will tackle on this. But uh, you know, a liquidity uh, infusion of liquidity, how much it's uh, whaling the speculative activities in the share market? Uh, theoretically, yes, possible, as you were saying. But uh, these quantitative studies are still few and far between. I mean, I cannot really say much until there is very serious study done on this that how much speculation and uh, these activities have been fueled by this liquidity boom and uh, about the opening of the demat account uh, in india if that is true I, again uh, i am not a you know person who deals too much on this financial economics so very hard to say but if demat accounts are being created as what i don't know what's the motivation behind demat account uh, what i mean it's a uh, it's trading it's trading in the stock market so people are sitting at home yeah, but, so but why should people in. why should people trade in the stock market when you know that there is unintended accumulation of inventories so blue chips yes some oh, of the blue chip companies but as i said in usa the amazon google microsoft have done exceedingly well there is uh, almost like 50% uh, uh, rise in their share prices. So if you choose your shares and if DMAT account is open to go for those, possible. I mean, I know DMAT account is open to the DMAT script that you invest in the US. I'm not going to worry about it because this is shown. I don't know what you're doing. There is some very interesting statistics which are coming in. That's like the penny stocks are going up also, along with the stocks at the top of the range, the blue chips, mm -hmm. penny stocks are going up because that is where the speculation is happening. So there are certain stocks which has grown 1000%, grown 500% in the last four or five months. And, and Sebi chief has come and said that this is probably something that's, as Professor Shah was saying, that's probably the next crisis coming from there. Possible, possible. I really cannot, uh, you know, the problem is the kind of movement in the share market in India. And if you look at the theories which are coming out, say, from USA, looking at their share markets and European markets, a certain extent, is entirely different. I mean, I find uh, the way the share prices and the analysis is done in those countries, especially in US and their theories, very difficult in this case. 
I don't understand these dynamics which plays in the in in in, in the kind of in, in the mind. And I I'm not sure the kind of the theory which you are saying. You have to distinguish between the small and big shareholdings. Yeah. I mean, who are these people who are buying it? I, 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 mean, I think by nature. I mean, well-known uh, stockholders or who are they? Uh, if I may add, uh, Ajita Oda, a particular jeta bolchen, sheta could be likely mona hoche. Karon stock market e je tu ekhon mane stocks are down. Ekto turbulence to chol jee, kintu mane generally to down. So ei to kenar spokhe bhalo somaya ki. Kintu ei bari kenar khetre jeta bapar hoche je duoto jamon kore sadaron investor ra ekta Sensex linked ba uh, FTSE links or apna Dow Jones uh, linked or jeta ke ki bol bolle jana je market ke jeta track kore je sab fund gulo. Sei seita kenar theke borong individual company jeta penny stock. A lot of companies are in distress, so good time to buy them. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you know that the future is a combina borong barbe, so that I am for a picric or a lap corbo. Of course, actor is a shop so my jay money ultra to the water to be free corra galona, but uh, it seems reasonable. So my a document as a hobby. Who are them? Who are these people who are buying it? Well, you will find a lot of this Jagabala Benami. But a particular group, a chapter, look at a jay, pasta chota name kinch. Indian story is absolutely market story. And to me, Jodi Ota state, to our standard rational logic, the accordo that may not work. The Yunami data to dictate. Who are these people who are buying these things? It's very murky business. I don't know really what's happening. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thanks okay. to all of you. Thank you so, so much. We just have a gala round of discussion uh, after two mesmeric lectures in the technical session one. And we really thank to all the speakers and all the uh, participants who have made this total discussion very love, lively. We are just waiting for tomorrow's session and we are expecting everyone to join uh, tomorrow around 2.30. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Have a very Thank good you. afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye to everybody. And to all participants, just a uh, small message. You have to feed, fill up your feedback form to get the certificate. Please fill up the feedback form to get the certificate. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 